This video is sponsored by Conflict of Nations, the free online PvP strategy game where you get to find out what it's like to take control of a real country and lead it in a modern global warfare. Set in the early 21st century, Conflict of Nations lets you take full control of a nation and find out what it's like to lead it in a modern global warfare in real-time games that can take weeks to complete. Fight up to 128 other players using everything from combat attack helicopters and airborne infantry units to stealth fighters and even nuclear ballistic submarines the perfect weapon to launch a nuclear attack on your enemy. Or maybe instead of hurling nukes at your foe, you'd rather forge alliances with him and use your combined power to take down another player. It's up to you to choose your own strategy and engage in epic battles as you try to take over the world. Best of all, you can play with the same account on both PC and mobile to never lose sight of your war. Infographics show viewers get a special gift of 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free when they use the link, but it's only available for 30 days. So click the link, choose a country, and start fighting your way to victory right now! A column of Ukrainian armored vehicles accompanied by tanks approaches their ready positions, prepared for a fresh assault into the Russian defenses outside Kherson. The Ukrainian counteroffensive has been wildly successful, beyond even the scope of the most optimistic military planners. Russia can't hold the line against Ukrainian grit and firepower, and its troops are on steady retreat across the entire eastern front. On Friday, September 30, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin had annexed four regions of Ukraine, declaring them Russian territory. This now allows him to use all available means at his disposal to neutralize the Ukrainian counterattack. Now, with his back against the wall, Vladimir Putin becomes the second person in history to order the use of nuclear weapons in war. A brilliant fireball lights up the night sky, incinerating the column of Ukrainian vehicles. Even inside their armored shells, the Ukrainian soldiers are killed instantly. Those who were far enough away to survive the heat and blast are killed by the radiation bombarding their bodies. Several hundred Ukrainian soldiers and a few dozen vehicles are destroyed. The attack has been largely insignificant in terms of military value. Ukrainian forces have mastered the tactic of dispersing and reuniting again for sudden offensives, but it sends a clear message to Ukraine and the rest of the world. Thousands of miles above the planet, a United States satellite, part of the American Space Surveillance Network, detects the distinct double flash of a nuclear explosion. The alarm is instantly relayed via communication satellites using the Secure Link 16 encrypted radio frequency system. Within 30 seconds of detection, the alarm has already reached a U.S. Space Force monitoring station in North America and similar offices around the NATO alliance. Minutes later, the alert reaches the desk of U.S. President Joe Biden. Picking up a secure phone, he dials a direct connection to General Mark A. Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the most powerful military officer on the planet. President Biden speaks only three words into the receiver, execute Plan 36. The coded order is relayed via U.S. communication satellite to Stuttgart, Germany, and the office of the commander of U.S. European Command, General Christopher G. Cavoli. Within minutes, the authenticated order is transmitted to U.S. forces in RAF Bentwaters and RAF Lakenheath inside England. A separate communique is dispatched to the USS supercarrier George H.W. Bush, currently stationed in the Mediterranean. The Bush is loitering in waters off the southern coast of Turkey, and the ship immediately turns into the wind as its flight deck erupts in a flurry of activity. Ever since Putin's threats of using nuclear weapons, the American military has been prepared to respond. Beneath the deck of the Bush, F-18 Super Hornets are having AIM-160 MALDs attached to wing hardpoints. Each Hornet can carry two of the large weapons, a capability kept secret from the world until now. Two squadrons of the high-performance aircraft are quickly made ready and begin the journey to the flight deck above where they stand ready. In England, crews rush to man a fleet of eight B-52 Stratofortress bombers. The big planes are the backbone of the U.S. bomber fleet and can bring a frighteningly large amount of firepower to bear thousands of miles away. Joining them are four B-2 bombers also kept on alert status, their crews ready to go at a moment's notice with bellies full of weapons. Within 15 minutes, the first planes are taking to the sky and turning southeast toward mainland Europe. Two hours later, the bomber fleet links up with two squadrons of U.S. Air Force F-22 Raptors, taking off from bases in Germany. The Raptors are flying in stealth configuration, which means their wing pylons are clean of weapons. The internal weapons bay, however, is loaded with six AIM-120 air-to-air missiles and two AIM-9 short-range missiles in the side bays. The formation continues toward the Black Sea, the F-22s leading the way. An hour later, the F-22s link up with a loitering U.S. Air Force tanker aircraft in order to top off their fuel stores. The B-52s loiter as the F-22s refuel. With enough capacity to fly strike missions in Europe from their home bases in America, the B-52s have no need to refuel. 
As the F-22s refuel, NATO AWACS aircraft flying along the Ukrainian and Turkish coasts sweep the skies with their powerful radar, looking for any potential hostile targets that could pose a problem for the mission. The aircraft's powerful radar only has a range just above 250 miles, so they can only see across approximately half of the Black Sea. Soon they'll move for a closer look, but in order to maintain the element of surprise, the AWACS stick to their normal flight pattern instituted at start of the Ukraine war. The F-22's refueling, however, is the signal for the USS Bush to begin launching her Super Hornets. One by one, the high-performance strike fighters take to the sky, their compatriots wheeling in the skies above the carrier strike group and waiting until both squadrons have taken to the air. Then the planes split into two groups, taking similar but distinct routes north and into Turkish airspace. One route will take the group west of Ankara, while another will take the other group over Sivas. An hour later, both squadrons pivot northeast, heading straight for the Black Sea. The B-52s, B-2s, and F-22s have now reached the Black Sea. The United States' operation to punish Russia for its use of nuclear weapons is a go. The B-2s take the lead now. The entire formation has turned south and then east again, which will allow it to skirt Crimea by 70 or so miles, well out of the effective range of Russian air defenses in the region. The target is Novorossiysk and the Russian naval base located there. After the sinking of the Moskva, the Russian Black Sea Fleet has moved its largest surface combat vessels here in order to keep them out of range of Western anti-ship weapons provided to Ukraine. The AWACS aircraft have shattered the formation, sweeping the skies with their powerful long-range radar. The job is to look for enemy fighters, thus allowing the accompanying F-22s to operate without their own search radars on, ensuring their stealth. However, the powerful radar is being picked up by Russian sensors in Crimea. The Russians now know that an attack is coming. NATO hasn't deviated in any significant way from its pre-announced patrol routes for months, and the only reason an AWACS aircraft could be approaching Russian shores is if it's backing up a major air attack. It's not long before the AWACS planes pick up the signature of multiple Russian fighters taking to the skies. The data is relayed via data link to the Raptors, who stand ready to greet the Russian challengers. It's now time for the Super Hornets to do their part. Skirting along the very edge of Russian long-range radar, the Hornets fire off their MALDs one by one. In minutes, 40 of the big missiles are screaming straight at mainland Russia. But the weapons aren't bombs. The miniature air launch decoy is an advanced drone that can perfectly replicate the radar return of nearly any aircraft in NATO's arsenal. Currently, the decoys are spoofing Russian radar returns to convince them a flight of B-52 bombers is incoming from the direction of Turkey, escorted by F-18s. This is a credible threat. The US maintains multiple air bases in one of NATO's most geographically strategic allies. Payloads away, the Hornets turn around and head for the bush. Russian long-range air defense radar in Crimea has spotted the real B-52s, but the appearance of a flight of B-52s escorted by F-18s incoming from Turkey is a more pressing threat. Russian ground crews have been scrambling to put three squadrons of interceptors into the air. Now a squadron consisting of a combination of MiG-29s and MiG-31s are wheeling south from air bases in Crimea and the Russian mainland. The jets are in full afterburner mode which consumes fuel at a frightening rate but pushes them to supersonic speeds. They must get to within 70 nautical miles of the incoming B-52s so they can intercept them with their long-range air-to-air missiles. The R-77-1s, NATO codename Adder, are inferior in range to their American AIM-120 counterparts, with only a range of 68 miles. This is roughly the range of the expected harpoons carried by the American B-52s, who have a range of around 75 nautical miles. Russia always doubted the US would respond with its own nukes, and this only left one possible target for American vengeance, the Russian Black Sea Fleet. An alert reaches the Russian vessels and waters just off of Novorossiysk. The fleet currently consists of the guided missile frigates Ladny, Admiral Essen, and Admiral Makarov, which has taken the role of fleet flagship after the loss of the Moskva. Landing ships Nikolai Filchenkov, Orsk, Azov, Novocherkask, Cesar Kunikov, and Yamal are all at dock. The smaller guided missile corvettes Vyshny Volaychok, Samum, Ingushetia, and Gravron take up stations around the frigates. This is the bulk of the Russian Black Sea Fleet currently in operation, with a few vessels on duty in the Mediterranean. US Navy submarines and F-15 Strike Eagles from Europe are already en route to destroy them. The entire fleet turns with their noses parallel to the incoming threat. This will allow each ship's SeaWiz systems maximum opportunity to engage any missiles that penetrate long-range air defenses. S-300 and S-400 batteries along Russia's eastern Black Sea coast open fire on the incoming decoys. The decoys are easily within the 242-mile range of both systems for targets with a radar return as large as a B-52. The number of incomings is overwhelming. This is a major American air assault, and the air defense batteries expend most of their missiles. The vessels of the Black Sea Fleet opt to let the shore units do their work and focus on defending against any aircraft or missiles which slip past. 
American B-2 stealth bombers open up with AGM-158 CLRASM anti-ship missiles, the planned replacement for the Harpoon. The US military still operates only a small number of the weapons and only recently adapted them for use with a B-2. Each of the four B-2s unleash a volley of 16 of these low-observable anti-ship missiles, and Russian radar screens light up as they detect the 64 incoming missiles. The attack is a complete surprise, and the missiles are moving so fast that shore-based air defense batteries have no chance of catching the missiles before they reach their targets. The fleet is on its own to defend against the attack. But the LRASM's low observable feature is making the missiles difficult to target. To make matters worse, their missiles now dive toward the ocean, flying just above the water as they scream toward their targets. The missiles are within several dozen nautical miles before Russian radars can not just detect them, but target them. The Russian ships immediately fire off decoys. These immediately begin to fire off electronic signals meant to be more powerful than those emitted by real vessels, thus luring in anti-ship missiles to strike them instead. However, the American missiles are built with optical target recognition systems, ensuring that the weapons can tell the difference between decoys and the real thing. At just over three dozen miles, the Russian radars finally can target the LRASMs, and the frigates are the first to open up with long-range surface-to-air missiles. It's like trying to hit a speeding bullet with another bullet, and the LRASMs can be difficult to target. Of the 64 incoming missiles, 16 are struck and destroyed. With just miles left to go, the corvettes open up with short-range Komar missiles. These missiles have a much smaller warhead, but several manage to strike true. Another eight LRASMs are knocked out of action. The American weapons now enter the terminal attack phase and suddenly pitch up, climbing high into the sky. More Russian anti-air missiles fly out to try to swat them out of the air. Another six LRASMs turn to fiery wrecks. Each missile identifies its own target, prioritizing the larger frigates. The sky fills with tungsten from the frigate SeaWiz systems. Ten more LRASMs are destroyed before striking true, but 22 find their targets. The 1,000-pound warheads slam into the Russian frigates. The Admiral Essen takes 10 of the missiles. She's already destroyed by the time the last three slam into her, but the missiles aren't smart enough to identify lethal battle damage. The Ladny only takes two and remains afloat with moderate damage. Admiral Makarov takes six LRASMs to the deck. The rest of the weapons either strike the smaller corvettes or explode in the water, missing their targets. Only two of the Russian frigates remain alive, along with three of the corvettes. Two Russian ships are quickly sinking below the waves. The attacking B-2s turn around and head for home, visible on Russian radar only for a moment as each bomber opened its bay doors. To the south of the fleet, the Russian interceptors are now in range to engage the MALDs and open up with R-77 missiles, ripple firing at the incoming formation. Each missile will find its own target, and with such a dense concentration of forces, should have no problem striking true. The Russian fighters are rapidly turning and burning for home, fully aware that American AIM-160s have a longer range than them. The lead Hornet should have opened fire by now, yet strangely no incoming missile threats are detected on radar. Reporting this to ground control, Russian commanders are beginning to grow suspicious. A second wave of interceptors is redirected west toward the incoming flight of eight B-52s. This happens to put them directly on course to intercept the B-2s, who are slow and vulnerable. In full afterburner, the Russian fighters will soon be in range of not just detection, but targeting of the stealthy aircraft. Right now, their focus are the big American bombers, who are completely vulnerable and helpless. Radar detects no accompanying fighters, which makes the Russian pilots very nervous. There are only two possibilities here. The eight B-52s are actually decoys, and the main attack is the 40 aircraft formation to the south, or the attack from the south is the decoy and this is the real thing. If the latter is the case, there can only be one reason why radar isn't detecting any accompanying fighters. The US has put its F-35s or F-22s into the fight. The intercepting fighters get their answer shortly after entering the Black Sea. The F-22s have skirted out into the Black Sea and away from the shore, keeping out of range of shore-based radar which can detect them within 100 or so miles. The Russian interceptors have even weaker radar and can only begin to pick up traces of the stealth fighters within 50 or so miles, but can only get good targeting locks from a few dozen miles away. The F-22s turn on their own targeting radar long enough to get a solid lock on the incoming Russian MiGs. On their radars, the Russians detect only a brief blip as each F-22 rapidly volley fires their AIM-120Ds. The AIM-120Ds have a classified range easily in excess of 100 nautical miles, and the MiGs don't even get to within range of the B-52s before they're forced to take evasive actions from the incoming missiles. Each missile has flown high into the sky immediately after firing and now plummets down on the Russian fighters. Each pilot tries to notch the incoming missile but most of them strike true. The surviving fighters are forced to turn around at full afterburner, but the Raptors already have loosed another volley of aims at them to encourage them to retreat. 
The only way to defeat the American stealth fighters is to overwhelm them with numbers and absorb their long-range missile attacks. Once at close range, the Raptors would have been at a disadvantage, but the Hornet-launched decoys fooled the Russians into splitting their forces. With the skies free of enemy fighters, the B-52s are safe to get within 75 nautical miles of the surviving Russian vessels and loose their harpoons. 96 anti-ship missiles are soon screaming toward the Russian ships. The frigates immediately respond with their long-range air defense missiles. The harpoons are far older technology and don't have the same low observability features of the LRASM. Long-range air defense managed to take out 20 of the incoming missiles as the harpoons get within a dozen miles of the ships. Then the corvettes open up with their shorter-range missiles. Each ship is rapidly volley-firing their entire missile stock, knowing their lives depend on it. 20 more of the harpoons are knocked out before they get into range of the fleet Sea Whiz. Tungsten once more fills the sky as a wall of lead rises up to greet the incoming missiles. 22 more harpoons are knocked out, either by missiles or Sea Whiz. Decoys manage to lure away a dozen or so of the harpoons, but 22 of the surviving missiles strike true. The 500-pound warheads smash into the corvettes and frigates, most of which have already been damaged by the LRASMs. Despite having half the warheads of the previous rocket volley, the blitz of missiles is lethal. As the B-52s head for home, Russia sends up more interceptors to take on the flight of MALDs to the south. The decoys are easily blown out of the sky by air and ground-based defenses, but all that does is expend precious resources Russia can no longer easily replenish. Their job is done. They succeeded in diverting Russian attention south and splitting up its interceptors. The Russian Black Sea Fleet has been destroyed. All that remains is four submarines which Russia doesn't dare put to sea for fear of being targeted and a complement of landing and support craft. The surface combat vessels were the important targets, and Russia suffered an irreplaceable loss. In the span of an hour, it went from the dominant military power in the Black Sea to the weakest. Blockades of Ukrainian ports are no longer possible, and Russia has been punished for its use of nuclear weapons with the loss of hundreds of sailors and billions of dollars in hardware. What remains to be seen is if the deterrent has been effective or if President Vladimir Putin will resort to even greater use of nuclear weapons as retaliation. If so, the United States stands ready with its allies to respond with either conventional or nuclear power. Thanks again to our sponsor Conflict of Nations, the free online PvP strategy game happening in a modern global warfare. Get a special gift of 13,000 gold in one month of premium subscription for free by using the link. It's only available for 30 days, so don't wait. Choose your country and start fighting your way to victory right now. Now go check out What If Russia Launched a Nuclear Bomb or click this other video instead.